So welcome everybody to the final edition of our 2022 Second Sight Conversations, highlighting nominees for Medium Photo's Second Sight Award. Nominations for the award were made by participating reviewers at the 2022 Medium Review, which took place in San Diego on May 5th and 6th of this year. I'm Scott Davis, the Executive Director of Medium Photo, and I'm happy to have all of you here today. Today, we are meeting two artists who will share presentations of their work, Anna Garner and Andre Ramos Woodard. Both artists participated in the 2022 Medium Review, with Andre having the honor of receiving one of our uh, 2022 Black Artist Scholarships. I should add that registration for the 2023 Medium Review opens next week on Thursday, November 17th. Members of Medium Photo can register for the review beginning on Tuesday, the 15th. So today, each artist will present their work, uh, followed by conversation and questions with Michelle Dunmarsh, founder of Minor Matters Books, located in Seattle, Washington. For those joining us live today, we encourage you to use the chat to submit questions. I'll be sharing relevant links about each artist's work uh, during the chat and today's program. I should also mention that today we are broadcasting from the unceded lands of the Kumeyaay people, who are the original inhabitants of San Diego and Tijuana. The Kumeyaay continue to call this land home and share their culture, stories, and art for the greater good. I'd like to express thanks to the Kumeyaay Nation for sharing this land with all of us. So we'll begin today's program with the work of Anna Garner. Anna Garner's work combines performance, sculpture, photography, and video to present contemplations on physical uncertainty and examine the intersections of nature, gender, and architecture. Anna was born in New York and raised in San Diego. She is currently based in Mexico City, where she and her wife co-direct the project space Proyecto Picaro. Anna's work is included in a new exhibition called Mountains and Rivers at the Oolong Gallery in Santa, um, excuse me, in Solana Beach, California. And her work is the subject of a solo exhibition currently on view at Lighthouse Works on Fishers Island in New York. In 2015, uh, Anna was the recipient of the Phoenix Art Museum's Contemporary Forum Artist Grant. Her work has also been supported uh, through residencies at the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, and Art OMI in 2019. I'm proud to welcome Anna Garner to begin today's conversation. Scott already gave a great introduction for me. Um, my work is a combination of sculpture, video, um, photography, and performance, it's always lens based. And so I'm either creating sculptures that I'm making um, to photograph or performing for the camera in some way, like in this video here where it's a performance for video. Um, I'm going to show you, I'm going to start with showing you two guys two different videos both that have to do with the idea of falling and creating a space of instability for my body within the frame. Um, and this particular one is called Pratt Fall, and it was taken from uh, a Buster Keaton stunt. And so I took a stunt that was about five seconds long and extended it to a little over four minutes to have something that was more, uh, that was longer and that could meditate more on that tension and instability of the moment before the fall. Um, and I oftentimes, so when I, when I talk about my work, I really like to show the behind the scenes because for me, so much of my work has to do with what is going on, um, sort of around the camera and the ability of the camera to frame and limit, um, information and the ability to, construct what's happening in front of the camera. And so this is a shot of what that video looked like in my studio at the time. And so we can kind of see everything that was around it and everything that was edited out to create something that um, was framed in this very clean way. Um, and this is another video that again is part of this work that I did about 
falling, about creating that sense of instability. Both of these pieces have to do with the fact that I myself as the artist am physically um, undermining myself, physically creating that, um, that state of instability. Um, and so this is the video on the one side and then the other shows how it looks installed. Uh, this is when it was installed at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Um, go ahead and move to the next. And this video in particular, I was thinking a lot about minimalist sculpture and that sense of verticality and emptiness uh, of space and the body um, moving within that or around that space and thinking about that sense of verticality as something that's very hyper-masculine and often thought of as being devoid of emotion or uh, physicality of the body itself. And so I wanted to create something in which that space was literally and physically deconstructed and filled with this sense of tension and emotion in a way that really couldn't be negated. And so this is again to show like behind the scenes to show my process. I start a lot with sketching. I'm actually a terrible drawer, which is why my background is in photo and sculpture and video, <laughs> anything that has nothing to do with drawing and painting because I cannot render. Um, so this is my really basic sketch of what the work is gonna look like and then what the piece looks like at the end and everything that was sort of built around it as a system of support to make this thing function. Um, and then to show you really briefly, I'll breeze through this one. I do sometimes make just sculptures and this is an example of one of those um, called Gravity is the Weakest Force. Um, my titles in this PowerPoint are in Spanish because this was from a lecture I had done in Spanish a while ago. Um, and for me, oftentimes when I'm working with sculpture, it still has this sense of attachment to the wall. And so it still works a lot with that. It feels kind of in between two dimensional and three dimensional, which is something I, I additionally work with within my images. Um, moving along, this is a series called Protecting Popo. And it's a series I created thinking a lot about my physical size and wanting to find somebody to work with that was literally double my size. Um, I would often have people, because I'm in my work so often, when I would meet people after they would see my work, I would get constant comments about my physical size and how in my work I appeared to be much larger than I am in person. And so that was something I wanted to think about and explore and address more directly within the work. The person that I'm lifting is a bodybuilder, and that was something I wanted to work with as well as somebody who I've lifted weights and gone to the gym for like 15 plus years. And so I've constantly been around that physical culture. And what I wanted was to create an image where that sense of strength was more confused, where this idea of like competition and lifting somebody wasn't necessarily clear whether... I was physically lifting him or he was helping me and to use that kind of that chiaroscuro style of lighting to create shadow and leave things unknown um, in terms of that as well. And so for me, what these images really end up expressing is a sense of fluidity about physical strength, um, this uh, something in between this competitive and intimate relationship between him and I, and an exploration of power and how that plays out visually, both in terms of gender, both in terms of like ethnicity and skin color and the ways in which like my body and his body varied so significantly um, and find a point somewhere in between all of those sort of complexities. When I was making it, I was looking a lot at um, these Renaissance sculptures and thinking about the ways that gender played out uh, between two bodies. And when both of the figures were masculine, that there was competition, there was a fight, there um, was tension and strength communicated. But when it was a male and a female, there was something different. The woman was fainting, the woman was potentially weak, the woman was needing help. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about 
um, those two different kinds of um, interactions uh, between the two figures and thinking a lot also about the uh, the paredu in ballet and the two the connection between um, two bodies. Um, and then again, from there, I really started thinking about this idea of strength and the body and physicality, um, and then starting to translate that quite a bit more to thinking about physical space and nature, landscape, mountains. And so again, this image of Arnold Schwarzenegger, like that idea of how do images visually create the sense of power um, over, especially over space? Um, and reading a lot about this, I, like the history of mountaineering and how much it's connected with imperialism, ideas of conquest, um, and thinking about what does it mean to get to the top of a mountain, to summit, and the idea and sense of power that that has often signified. And so for this series, <laughs> Um, I made these forms that are abstracted mountains. They're made out of plywood and painted. They're really kind of the most basic sort of forms you could use um, or like ways that you could make a form sculpturally, right? And for this, I was thinking a lot about the design of theatrical sets and the ways that something flat through distance, through light, through perception, could transform into something that had uh, more of a sense of dimensionality or a stand-in for a space outside of that, um, that stage. Um, and so for these, the idea was that these were forms that I could pick up, that I could move around. And so that signification of what it means to get to the top would become a parody, would become something that was almost meaningless in the fact that it was there was very little sense of adversity in terms of actually getting there. Um, and so that that idea of what does it mean to conquer the top, to conquer the mountain uh, could change. Um, from there, I really continued to think more about the construction of physical spaces, especially within nature and within landscape. Um, and went more uh, towards that. And so thinking about ways to replicate nature through both sculpture and photography. And again, to think of the idea of the frame, to think about the ability that photography has to manipulate uh, the understanding of what is being looked at, of what nature is, of what landscape is. And so this is a, uh, well, not a series, just uh, a diptych of images called Night Sky with Matterhorns, which I sculpted out of, um, of plaster. Um, and it's of the Matterhorn Mountain, but not the one in Europe. The one in Disneyland is what I use to model it after. And so it's a lot of thinking about ways that nature is mediated and um, and in that process, and so it, it becomes so removed from the physical space and in that process, thinking about what's lost. And so for that reason, I pushed these images really, really dark to think about the things that are still unknown, even though there's a sense of being able to know and understand every aspect of it. Um, there's still so much that stays unknown. Five minutes, Anna. Thank you. Um, which is great. I'm almost done. Um, and so that brings me to um, the next six images, which I'll show you, uh, which is part of a larger series called Composing Land, uh, which four of them are on view right now at Ulan Gallery in San Diego. And so again, this was me working with this um, sense of flat forms, thinking a lot about theatrical set design again, and looking at forms within the landscape. Um, very specifically in these works, I was looking at forms uh, primarily from um, uh, Utah and Arizona of these like monumental rock formations, again, which for me circled back to the monumentality of the um, minimalist sculpture that I had been looking at before, but looking at it in a very different way, looking at it in a way of some something that was not constructed by man, but that existed in nature, but then considering what the relationship to that kind of form is uh, and ways to replicate that. Um, and again, working through this sense of 
of um, photography as something that's a fabrication, that what's in front of the lens is not necessarily reality and thinking about ways that uh, landscape forms, landscape as a genre forms a larger understanding of what land, what landscape is and what the sort of human interaction with land is um, and how that that is something that can also be ideological and constructed and not based in reality and often as well about control and resources. And so I wanted these images to be able to show that fabrication, to show the construction, um, to not read as um, something that's real, um, to show a bit of what that uh, the what is behind the illusion. And in some of these as well, I'm performing within them. And again, for me, the images in which I'm performing um, are a lot about finding points of instability. Um, and for me, that was part of the choice of the, the shoe wear was having something that um, did not allow me necessarily to have a better footing. Um, there's a lot in my work about the sense of deconstruction, the sense of instability really flows through my works in many different ways. Um, and sometimes as in this one, uh, I was able to, you know, point to that to find that within um, how I'm using my body and what I'm wearing. Um, and then again, to show you guys behind the scenes so you can kind of see where it goes from like physical sculpture to working in these really sort of strange configurations to create this illusion and um, how for me it does kind of end up looking like something that's backstage of a theater or something strange like that. Um, and this is the last image I'll show you. Um, there's no information on it because it's a newer work and I haven't, I still haven't settled on a title. Um, but for me, this was a little bit of a break from how I was working before because in the image, I'm showing more of what's behind. And so I'm showing on the, what's my right side here, the structure that's supporting um, this stage, this set that I've made. Um, and so I wanted to, that was something I wanted to start bringing into the work was a bit more of the reveal um, of what's been fabricated. And I will end it there and um, stop sharing my screen. Um, Thank you. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. So um, as promised, we are going to move right into Andre's presentation, and then we're going to come back for questions and conversation. So I'll do a quick introduction for Andre. Um, Andre Ramos Woodard is an artist who was raised in the southern states of Tennessee and Texas. Andre is a contemporary artist who uses their work to emphasize the experiences of the underrepresented, celebrating <clears throat> marginalized peoples while accenting the repercussions of contemporary and historical discrimination. Andre works in a variety of media, including photography, text, and illustration. Their work creates collages that convey ideas of communal and personal identity influenced by their direct experience with life as a queer African-American, focused on Black liberation, queer justice, and the reality of mental health, Ramos Woodard works to amplify repressed voices and bring power to the people. Andre is a recipient of the Dennis Roussel Fellowship from the Center for Fine Art Photography and was selected for this uh, Silver Eye, the 2021 Silver List, I should say, from the Silver Eye Center for Photography. He has shown his work in many prominent institutions across the United States, including the Tamarind Institute in Albuquerque, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Lyon Gallery in Denver, and at Filter Photo in Chicago. Please help me in welcoming Andre Ramos Woodard. Wow, that was so sweet. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, and shout outs to Anna. That was nice. That was nice, girl. Um, yeah, that was really, really nice. Um, I am just excited to be in dialogue with you and Michelle, but you know, like, it's interesting that there's a lot of parallels in our work that I feel like we're going to talk about in just a moment. But anyway, 
I guess I got to talk about myself. So let's get right into it. Let me, let me see if this works. All right, all right, all right. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Are we good? Okay. Um, so yeah, also thank you so much for that, for the uh, introduction, Scott. I really, really genuinely appreciate it. Um, so for those that do not know me, my name is Andre Ramos Woodard and I'm black and I'm queer and I'm from the South, always been those things and I will always continue to be those things. Um, was born in Nashville, Tennessee, um, and I'm also a triplet and I have a little sister and I have two amazing parents. I only say those things because they're they're pretty important to my work. I'm very much influenced by my, like Scott said, my direct experience with life, who I interact with and how that happens, um, my family, my, my loves, uh, my hates, a lot of things that about that I deal with and experience come through in my work. Um, and so on the left, that's a portrait that I don't know who took, but uh, um, about someone in my family took at a family gathering of me and my amazing brothers and little sister. Uh, and then on the right, it's just a portrait of me, something that I recently took, some new work. But I'm doing a little bit differently. I'm talking specifically about one body of work. I do do a lot of things. Um, but I'd like to speak to you guys today about Black Snafu, as it was the project that I brought with me uh, to Medium. And so I think it'd be kind of fitting to, to talk about that. So let's get into it. So, so Black Snafu is a project that I started a few years ago. Um, and I was doing some research on the history of Black people, specifically the history of Black people in American cartooning. I went into it with, you know, some with some hope and some positivity, thinking about like, oh, like what have my predecessors before me created? What does blackness look like through this lens? Um, but it, it wasn't it wasn't a very pretty sight, unfortunately. That being said, I did find a lot of things that are very pertinent and important in American history and the history of cartooning. Um, and so Private Snafu was something that I uncovered while I was looking. And Private Snafu was this cartoon series that was made in the 1940s uh, during World War II. And it was created to kind of boost team morale for American soldiers. Um, to quote, it says, it was to instruct the military about security, sanitation habits, booby traps and other military subjects. Um, and also, so it was the 1940s, right? Not everyone had and still doesn't have the privilege of education, but cartoons were accessible to people of all ages and all demographics and all backgrounds. And so cartoons became this way to kind of teach soldiers about the goods and pros and wrongs of being a soldier without ha having to put a book in front of them and making them read. So it worked out for them. Um, that being said, when we talk about specifically Private Snafu, Private Snafu is not good. Um, he's not good. I mean, to me, he's kind of good because he's inherently anti the system because he's such a bad soldier, but he's just not a good soldier. He drinks way too much what he's supposed to be not drinking, right? Like doing whatever military people do. He's always like eye hoggling women. He leaks classified information. He skips out on like vaccines. He does a lot of things that you're not supposed to do as a soldier in the military. And it, while it was comical and funny, like I was saying, these examples were meant to teach soldiers that were watching them how not to be. Um, and so while they are doing that, they're very ripe with the morals of America. At the very least in the mid 20th century, and I could argue to this day, they're filled with very racist, specifically anti-Asian propaganda, very misogynist visualizations and propaganda, um, and very pro-capitalist um, propaganda. And it's it's not cute, I don't like it. Um, but that being said, it's it's while it's not cute, it's very much a prevalent and important part of our history that we gotta recognize. So me, I like to steal stuff, right? I, I very much like to reappropriate and claim stuff. And so while looking through the history of Private Snafu, I thought about the text and what that means. Snafu means, uh, it's military speech, right? It means situation normal, all fucked up or all fouled up. And so I thought it would be nice for me to reclaim that language in this body of work where I'm investigating the history of Blackness and the history of Americanism. I mean, so Black Snafu for me means situation niggas all fucked up because quite literally, American history and colonialism has absolutely fucked up the ways that we perceive Black people. 
Um, and so that's, this is the statement. I ain't gonna get too into it. You can read it if you'd like, um, but we're gonna talk about the work. So that's, that's there. So I'm gonna jump straight into it. Um, so this was the first piece that I made for Black Snafu. And uh, when I was doing some research about, uh, you know, these illustrations, I found a lot of disgustingly racist imagery, caricatures, minstrels, blackface, right? That, that white people, Walt Disney and white cartoonists had made in response to vaudeville and just early entertainment that was inherently racist. Um, I don't think these depictions at all accurately portray Black people, right? But they were at once indicative of Blackness to someone in American history. And so let's talk about that. I wanted to talk about that and reclaim these drawings for my own usage and fight back against them at the same time. And so my first idea in this series was to take photographs that were specifically celebratory of the Black experience and put them up against images or drawings that were um, that, that were minstrels that were not pro-Black, to talk about that dialogue, to talk about my specific experience and positivity as a Black person versus the ways that Black people have been treated and seen throughout our history. Um, and so this piece, Buds, uh, is when I first started draw growing out, well, not first started, when I started growing out my dreadlocks for the third time. Um, but, you know, I I love my locks. It's, it's a very time-consuming process. I got to take care of my hair, wash it specifically, product. Like, this is not... This ain't just happened, right? But anyone that knows about locks, especially Black people, know that. They know it's not something that is dirty. Um, it's something to be celebrated. And to be honest with you, Black people specifically, with coarse hair textures, that sort of hair texture is perfect for locking hair. And so I'm taking this picture in celebration of that. I put myself outside in nature in the way that my hair is, very natural, right? And put them up against uh, this blackface menstrual was questioning the legitimacy of my hair. Um, and so this is Walt Disney. <laughs> if you don't know, now you do know. And this is him drawing in his studio, you know, just doing what he's doing, being racist. Um, and, but he drew Mella, he drew Mickey Mouse in this cartoon called Mellor Drammer. Um, and in this cartoon, Mickey Mouse and the gang dress up as minstrels, even though they're already minstrels to begin with, but they go out of their way to separate themselves from blackness by blacking up their face and putting on like these wigs that, uh, that resemble locks to participate in this act of racism by depicting Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's crazy to me how while black, like Mickey Mouse characters that are completely black that have their hands uh, covered in white gloves, based in blackface minstrelsy, still have to separate themselves from blackness because especially at the time, blackness was so low that even these cartoon characters didn't want to be or could not be correlated with that idea. Um, and so I took that because one, Mickey Mouse is so popular, right? But he's absolutely based in the history of blackface minstrelsy. I'm gonna take him and I'm gonna use him to highlight and accentuate my locks in another way. Um, and so this was actually some locks that I had cut off the second time and I kept them because I didn't wanna get rid of them. And so I'm using Mac, um, I'm using Mickey Mouse as this minstrel to, to call attention to my hair because to celebrate even more so. And as I continued to make the work, I thought I was thinking more about Black Snafu, right? And more about the depictions of Blackness. Um, but the unfortunate reality of Black identity specifically and identity for marginalized people in general in this country is that it's not pretty. It's not fun. It's not simple, right? It is riddled with racism. It is riddled with misogyny. And so while I originally went to think about um, positive intentionality with the, with the photographs, I started thinking about realism and how could I depict the realities of blackness in my photographs? On the left, uh, we have news, and it's a picture I've taken of all these news clippings of police brutality and uh, just harm done to black people in American history. Uh, and I overlap that with this depiction from uh, an old cartoon called Sunday Go to Meeting Time where a black, black character goes to hell and all the demons are black faced minstrels. When I know and we know in the history of Black America and Pan-African people in general, the demons in their lives have not been other Black people. It has been colonialism and white supremacy. And on the right, we have a, a me, question mark, because I'm a photographer. I'm a Black photographer. 
I'm a male bodied person. I took that picture of myself in the mirror, but I overlapped it with this minstrel character, this depiction of a black photographer from the 1920s, right? To fight against myself. Um, but, I'm, but I'm asking that question to the audience really like, what do you see me as? I know what I see me as, but what do you see me as? And, and also, how does American history see me and not just my Black body, my Black personality and essence? What is that? And how does it fight against what has been told before? I think we might have five minutes left. Very maybe. good. Thank okay. you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't have a whole lot left, but these are Two more pieces, and I think specifically about celebration for me. Um, on the left is a piece called Boogeyman, and it's this piece of me nude in, a, in my studio in a very dark situation or dark lighting situation with a black mask over my face. And what I've done is cloaked myself entirely in this idea of black through the lens of photography. You know, I'm, it's not, it's a dark scene. Um, and also I think about how we are told to be scared of the dark and nighttime is scary and all those things are correlated with the word or the color black but so am i i don't think that black especially when it related to to identity is a scary thing and so i cloak myself and cover myself in this blackness because I, it's not scary to me um it's something to be proud of it's something to be courageous about and so i drew huey and riley freeman from the boondocks some of the most pro-black characters in the history of cartooning ever on top of that uh, on top of that drawing and then on the right, uh, bling, baby, I love gold. I will not lie to you. I do love gold. Um, it's something that I don't know. I just always love gold and jewelry. But I also am very aware that jewelry is prevalent within Black culture, hip hop culture specifically. You think about the people who came out from nothing and used jewelry and the things that they were wearing to, to, to show off themselves, to tell the world that they have come from nothing, that they are, they're, that, that they're, they are not to be looked down upon by any means. Um, and so I think about jewelry as uh, an act of resistance in a way, you know, it's, it's, it's celebrating yourself and celebrating the fact that we have to live in this capitalistic society. We gonna at least do what we want and look how we want to look. Um, and so I, I love that. I love thinking about, uh, you know, just black celebration. And so for me, bling is all about celebrating the beautiful ways uh, that black people have looked and used jewelry to accent themselves. So um, as you guys, probably can tell I draw on these images. Oh, let me let me tell you guys that I, these are photographs, right? But they're also drawn on top of, I draw in Procreate, put them together in Photoshop, and then draw on top of the photographs with traditional material to kind of let them, to finish them and, and finalize them. Um, so marking on top of thing, things is very important to me. It's like an active reclamation is what I've learned. Um, and so this piece, uh, untitled, parentheses American flag is just a flag that I drew on top of. And so I'm thinking very specifically about the history of America, right? Like it's a melting pot. All of these depictions are American, but the fact is they're racist, you know? And, but also in Americanism or colonialism, um, we also know that it's not just anti-Black. We know that it is anti-Asian, it is anti-Jewish and Irish and native and Latinx, right? There's different facets of non-whiteness that have been discriminated against at the hands of colonialism. And I wanted to make sure that people know that, right? People have to, the, the sooner we reconcile with the negativities of the past and present, the future we can move, the, the future, the, the, the faster we can move past them. I mean, so while it's important for me to talk about Black identity, specifically as a Black person, in this piece, I want to talk about colonialism and the history of American racism. And so I think I got a couple more slides. I'm going to kind of go fast. Uh, this piece is called Hero. And so in this piece, I'm thinking specifically or more about American identity, the representation of the flag. But I'm drawn um, John Henry, who is from the Marvel Universe and is a superhero. He's also based on the uh, old folklore where John Henry beats the machine and like makes a railroad, something crazy, right? But but any, anyway, he means power, he means strength. And so by butting him up against or putting him on top of this burned American flag on this burned frame, he is the pinnacle of, of power and, and just non-harm in this image. Um, and so also whenever I do, like whenever I show the work, it's really important for me to kind of draw on the wall. Uh, it's not necessarily like 
the end all be all, right? But it allows me to expand the ways audience can interpret the work because I draw on the images and by drawing in the space, it allows me to kind of like create a conceptual, can, like kind of create an entire conceptual installation that fits together and it can become site specific depending on where it is. Um, gonna go a little fast. These are some more pieces in the, in the work. These are some newer pieces. Um, a lot of it was based in minstrelsy, but I also am thinking about um, positive black characters. Minstrelsy is important because it is our history as American people. But uh, you know, it's I, it gets tiresome to look at misogyny and racism all day. So I thought about pro-black characters and how can I use black characters from my childhood in these in these contexts. Um, so more newer work, very recent work. Um, and so I'm thinking more about language. And uh, I've also had the idea that I, something that I also not necessarily struggle with, but I aspire for my work is to talk about the history of blackness and black identity in a way that is accurate and not detrimental, right? And so I wanna think about what ways can language, has language been used against black people and what ways can that be flipped? On um, the second, I mean, the first piece, Hate Monger um, is from the Mar a, a villain from the Marvel Universe who was based on Adolf Hitler, who just spits hate speech around. And so how can that become, how is that prevalent today? And how can it be looked at from a context to where someone who's not black can understand that, right? Um, and on we, the right- We are space. at time, but can Ooh. you show us the last slides that you have? And then let's continue the conversation just as conversation. Yeah, yeah, let me, this is the last slide. Um, and so this is, I've, I was reading this book called The Birth of an Industry, which I haven't finished, but it's all about the history of Black-based menstruacy. And so I'm been, I've been thinking more about my role as the person in between the camera or in between the idea and the finished product that gets presented to people. Um, and yeah, I went over time, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Wait, how do I stop? Okay, we're good. I think that um, last comment, Andre, is just such a great way of picking up something that I see as points of commonality between your work and Anna's work of this, um, this kind of play as the creator, right, but standing between what I'm creating, what's going forth into the world, and and specifically thinking about Andre with your work, surface, but Anna also with your work, the 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 tension, right, that you're creating these sets and playing with a kind of sense of of dimensionality. I also noted um, that Anna, you referenced sort of photographs not being reality, and then Andre, you also mentioned like the importance of the photograph as reality. So. Um, I'm just gonna sort of start with, can you um, each speak a little bit to, as you have, that that's the tension of dimensionality, right? What does it mean to deepen the surface, Anna, through what you're constructing, Andre, through what you're constructing? I mean, they're, they are uh, really fascinating constructions in visually very different ways, but I think ideologically, there's some similarities to what the two of you are, are pushing at. And then you want to go. <laughs> um, yeah, I can speak to that. Um, yeah, I was thinking too, uh, as you were talking, Andre, about thinking about the connections between our work and the way that we work, and that it is a lot about what Michelle was bringing up about this idea of dimensionality. And I think also that understanding of like, what is an image and how does the viewer interact with and understand that the image and that there's this way that both of us make ourselves present as the maker uh, mm -hmm. within that process of how we don't necessarily present a straightforward image. Me through the fact that I'm literally constructing everything in front of the camera and you through the way that you are like drawing on top of it, thinking about characters, thinking about the way like presenting your body in a specific way. <laughs> Sorry guys, that's my puppy. <laughs> <laughs> We, we love puppies, ain't nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, and so I, I don't know, I think there's something really interesting that I find in the connections of like, our subjects are really different, but I think the way that we approach the medium and the idea of an image and a surface and the history of that and want to, like, we want to, we both want to intervene. There's this idea of like, deconstructing, of questioning the viewer. I think, 
Yeah. And that's something I find just very exciting within your work when I look at your work. So oh uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. No, the feeling is very, very mutual. It's I um I was talking to a coworker actually today about this of a podcast that I listened to who a photographer was talking about this. Um, and so they were talking about photographers as, as two kind of genres, and um, maybe there's more, sure, but they were talking about photographers as scavengers, those that use their camera to go out into the world and respond to the world, and those as sculptors who think about what the, what the camera is going to take after you've created the the image right um and so I don't know I guess I was thinking a lot about that I couldn't I I mean girl I got an MFA in photography yes like I love it but I would always consider myself and always have been a sculptor and I feel similarly I feel like there's a tie in your work as well I don't know I'm also drawn to the ideas of like questioning reality it's funny because like I was using photographs uh, as like, especially about black identity to call attention to my depicted reality. But I also know that the photographic medium is not reality by any means, even like photojournalism, right? Like there's a lot of things that we are, that we can question about that. Um, yeah, I don't know you know where I'm going with that, but. I, I would love to say that we have to have a future conversation about, uh, photography's denial of photography or unwillingness to claim photography. Oh, but we yeah. definitely don't have time to do that today. <laughs> I have a lot of opinions and a lot of feels on this, but I come from a different generation, as Scott does. So I do think that it's a generational um, shift and it's a conversation that needs to happen, yeah. not necessarily the conversation that, that we need to have right now. Um, Anna, I'm going to ask you, so... Andre, one of the things that I love, I love that you started with a picture of your family. I love that you're very sort of transparent and rooted in like, these are things that influence me. And Anna, I want to push you a little bit because I feel like there's like these things hovering beneath the surface that you're addressing in a very smart way. But I also want um, to hear from you a little bit of like, how does it feel? How does it feel when you're making these things, when you're, when you're moving things around, when you're lifting another person when you're deliberately choosing um a high-heeled very feminine shoe to 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 stand in a precarious spot can you mm -hmm. can you just from a personal place talk to me a little bit about that yeah i think it's an, an inter interesting question um i think that there's a way that in my practice i've always wanted to deny the presence of talking about gender and so I've always wanted to just say no it's not about gender it's not about gender to not have my work pigeoned as something that was just talking about gender and female identity and so I think that there's a way that I'm like just now starting to sort of place more of those words around it because I'm coming up against the inevitability of the fact that I have a female body that like it expresses that way and that there are certain choices that I have made within my work from like my early 20s that have consistently addressed that. Um, and the idea of just also for me, I think like what it means and how it feels to like inhabit my specific body. And also I think a lot, like I have a background in dance, I have a background in like weightlifting. And I think a lot about like perceptions of like how um, my sizes, how I'm viewed when I'm at the gym, when I'm surrounded by men, when I'm oftentimes the only woman. And so I think a lot about those things in my work. I think when I'm dealing with identity, like, or not identity, when I'm dealing with like instability, there's a way that I think about the fact that like, um, maybe like going back to that idea of reality. And I don't know if I'm even answering your question anymore, but that like reality is a construction and what I see as sort of my reality of who I am and how I am in this world can also be something that's incredibly unstable. Um, and wanting in many ways to, yeah, deconstruct that and the foundations of like a vision and seeing and power through seeing have a lot to do it also with like identity, white supremacy, structures of racism, structures of power and the ways of seeing and photography is so, like I could talk about like go in depth, like 
if this was a much longer talk, but it's so interconnected. And there's a way that I feel through destabilization, through deconstruction in my work that I'm able to think about that and question like the stability of the structures of which our society is constructed and how visuality, how pho photography and images intersect with that. Um, Thank you so much, because I, I do feel like there is a strong link, again, that you both as makers are creating spaces and you're constructing images, creating images um, that visually have obviously very different um, physicality in terms of their end results, but that there is this uh, link, which I know was actually not, and I don't know if the two of you know this, but like Scott's intention was like just to have two people present their work and then just kind of treat this as each of you having an independent uh, discussion. And when I saw what each of you were posting online, rallying people to come to our great discussion, it was, I'm excited to talk to you, uh, to talk about our work in how it relates to each other. And that to me was so exciting that I actually wrote Scott and said, can we change the format? Because I think actually that Anna and Andre's work have these underlying the notion of of instability, the notion of questioning structures of power, which both of you are doing in such beautiful, powerful, thoughtful ways, but that come out with this completely different visual result, right? Which is the, the joy for those of us who are viewers get to have that opportunity to perhaps see things in each of your work that because we're having this conversation together, we wouldn't necessarily have thought about, right? So to think about construction within Andre's work in a way that people perhaps may be stuck more on the content, right? Because you have a clarity around how you're discussing the content, but Anna's work brings out, well, let's look at what you're doing with that content and your intentionality around positioning and construction, framing the layers. And the same thing for you, Anna, that there is a, um, I, I can look at your work from a very formal position and you speak about it be beautifully in what you are working with and what you are challenging and the elements that go with that. But I also love that this is an opportunity to dig around those, those corners and also get at some of those issues that we, we continue to fight for to be seen in the totality of, of who, who we are and how we make and when we wanna draw from that and when we wanna ditch it and that both are valid. Scott, how much time do we have? Yeah. Oh, you've used it. Yeah, we have a few more minutes. Um, we can circle through. How about another question, Michelle? Yeah. Um, oh, there's so many things I wanted to talk about, but can we um, can we talk about titles for a minute? Because I uh, was definitely noticing that both of you use language and Andre I'm so glad that you describe text as uh one of the media you work within that made me really happy uh <laughs> how do you and then I love that actually you both ended with showing uh work in progress that you're both like man not sure where this is going to go what this is going to be called but you know uh so I don't know if you planned that but it was fantastic so can you talk a little bit about what titling means to you, where it occurs, when do the words come first and the piece follows, when is it the opposite? Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Andre, why don't you start? <laughs> okay. I was like, <laughs> um wow, that's such a cool question. Cause I love titling work. Um I don't know. I mean like I think, you know, like whenever you listen to a song, um, you know, it's always got a title. How many how many songs have you listened to that are called untitled? Um, but but the, I say that because music is a really inspirational part of my art making practice, just as much as uh, photography and drawing and anime. You know, these different facets influence me, and so sometimes the title comes from like an emotion, strictly an emotion. Like um, there's a piece that I have in an older body of work, and it's called it's. Uh, called Weapon, parentheses, George Zimmerman sold the gun that he killed Trayvon Martin with for a quarter million dollars. And so like that title is specifically out of anger, 
because people need to know about that. Uh, I mean, it's not the piece is the the piece, the piece, but the title is also damn near its own piece. They're like it's like a diptych in a way. Um, and so sometimes it's really important for me to use titles to get information out there or to make someone think about something. Um, but sometimes it just, sometimes it comes afterwards. Sometimes I'm like, have to marinate on what the piece means to me. And, uh, and then I'll be like, oh, I guess this one's titled me. Uh, you know, sometimes it's something simple like that. But I think typically for me, it comes from a feeling. What about you, Amy? Um, Titles <laughs> are always hard for me. Um, I never start a project with a title. Uh, because I also always start projects thinking it's about one thing and then in the process I am very very process oriented and so in the process for me of making it always changes <laughs> it almost never comes out the way that I originally thought that it would or even necessarily about the specific theme I'm thinking that it, it's always I mean obviously it's always within the same thing but I'm always thinking okay it's going to be like I'm going to create this situation where my body is on top of all of these like rocks that are piled up and it's going to look really crazy and unstable. And then it, this is, I'm talking about like the last project I did. And then it ends up where I'm in the middle of everything and I'm just being covered up. And so it ends up being so different. And for me, that's my favorite way of working is having this like sense of not knowing, like having a little bit of something that I start with and then I allow the process to inform me. Um, and in that way, titles are always on the back end. And I always sit down with my wife and we talk and we brainstorm um, because I'm, I think I'm good at writing and I love writing, but never about my own work. Uh -huh. Because when it comes to like my own, I'm, I'm, my head is too stuck and I have to get someone to help me out of it. Um, but in general, I like my titles because my work can be seen maybe potentially as just something incredibly abstract. I like the titles to try to bring in something that um, allows a hinting of the content that I was um, working on getting at. Um, and yeah. That's great. Thank you both. I will be following up with each of you because I clearly want to now schedule a studio visit for a longer <laughs> conversation. Uh, so <laughs> if you two are uh, individually down for that, um, for expect sure. to hear from me. Absolutely. Scott yeah. and Medium, thank you so much for bringing us all here together. You are very welcome. My thanks to the three of you for making today's program enriching. Um, to everybody who's joined us for the live talk today, thank you. It's been great. Uh, I will give uh, close with one last reminder that the 2023 Medium Review opens for registration next week. This is exactly why we are here with Anna and Andre and Michelle. Um, so that uh, will conclude our conversation today. Thank you all. <laughs>